Please sit. Welcome to this inaugural lecture by Jonathan Zittrain. Uh, and I'm just going to say a very, very few words. It's not always done in Oxford, but I think it's nice if it is. Jonathan Zittrain is the first holder of the Chair in Internet Governance and Regulation at the Oxford Internet Institute. He's also the Jack and Lillian Berkman Visiting Professor for Entrepreneurial Legal Studies at Harvard Law School, and he's a director and founder with Charles Nesson of its Berkman Center for Internet and Society. And I'm happy to say that he is also a professorial fellow in my college, so I'm very pleased to be able to preside on this occasion. I did, as one should um, for a professor of internet governance and regulations, look him up on Google before I came along, and I found that there are uh, circa 180,000 hits for Jonathan Zittrain. <laughs> Try spelling it wrong. <laughs> well, um, he, he was educated at Yale and at Harvard Law School and at the John F. Kennedy School of Government, Government. And his topic is the future of the internet and how to stop it, which I gather uh, from my little Google episode is also the title of a forthcoming book. And there will not be questions afterwards as is usual um, after inaugural lectures, but you will be able to congratulate him downstairs um, on the way out in the entrance hall to schools, and I'm sure you'll want to do that. So I'll now ask him to give his lecture. John. Thank you, Dame Averill, and good afternoon. What a beautiful afternoon it is. A small sphere appears to be in the sky casting light. I'm not sure what that is, but I'm very pleased to see it. And in fact, I think it bodes that the conversation we have a chance to have today be an optimistic one. And while it's true the title of the lecture and of the book is The Future of the Internet and How to Stop It, of course, I arrive at this field long before having taken it up as an academic pursuit as someone who has, like many others in this room, a nerd-like joy with what the technology offers. And I want to make sure that we have a chance to dwell on that as we think about the future of the internet and the importance that this kind of joy has in understanding and defending its future. I think one concept, pair of concepts, that will be evolving, even now is in flux, thanks to the internet, is the public and the private. Here we have citizens lining up for the Queen's 80th birthday outside Windsor Castle. It's fairly clear who the public are. There they are in line. The government there present with yellow jackets to keep them organized. And inside the castle, I suppose, another form of public figure representing the public itself, representing the state. When we think then of private, who is private? Well, in the study of internet so far, private has largely been the realm of privacy, a subject that I last visited academically around 2000, and since which I have been quite tired of. And here's the part of privacy that I find least interesting. And then I'll explain why I'm bothering to tell you about it. That's privacy as defense. This is the general standard understanding of what privacy matters in the internet context. And it basically views the government in the position of trying to defend our privacy against those who would intrude upon it such as private firms. We ask of private firms that they come up with a privacy policy on their website, which no one reads. I see here a website devoted to providing firms with their own sample privacy policies so that even the firms themselves don't have to read them before putting them up. What do these say? I don't know. Do they matter? I think not. And yet, somehow, these policies have been a linchpin 
Now, there's been some legislative expansion in the United States and in Europe. A California law from 2003 says, quite simply, if you expose your customers' data to view by others, then you need to tell the public involved that their data has been compromised. This has led to a rash of letters drafted by consummate marketing professionals trying to figure out how to send a bulk mail to 3.9 million people telling them that their package containing tapes with all of their social security numbers, national uh, identity numbers and such has been lost. It turns out that if you include coupons with the letter, it works out very well. <laughs> Privacy has also meant wondering the ways in which technology might intrude further upon us. As systems have been tried, this one dating from around 1998, to lock up intellectual property. So here's a Stephen King book called Riding the Bullet that you can only get as an electronic book. And it appears inside what's called a glass book reader, such that if you ask to turn pages, simulated page turning sounds are made. But when you ask to print it out, feeling somewhat foolish, not only because you're reading a Stephen King book, but because you're reading it on your laptop, it says, I'm sorry, but I can't print that. At the same time, it has an opportunity to gather information about what pages you lingered upon and what you skipped, perhaps assisting Stephen King in knowing that chapter three needs a little work, but things pick up slightly thereafter. Now, as these intrusive systems have come about, we've seen some backlash. One system placed onto compact disks by Sony Incorporated. Actually, when you put that disk into your PC to listen to it, deposited and then hid executable code on the machine that would first and foremost try to make it so that you could not copy the CD, and secondly, perhaps have an opportunity to gather information about what you think in the CD without putting you to the trouble of filling out and returning a survey. This resulted in some controversy. The CD by Van Zant, appropriately entitled under the circumstances, Get Right with the Man, fell from number 887 on Amazon sales list to 25,802 after the root kit, as it is called, was discovered. And in fact, I can't help but share with you my top three Sony extended copy protection compact discs. Number three is the Invisible Invasion. There is the Invisible Invasion right now, please. There we go. Uh, number two is Suspicious Activity. And I think number one is Healthy and Paranoid Times, the CD that does more than just play music for you. If I want to look at this kind of privacy as defense, trying to protect ourselves from surveillance, in this case by corporations when we don't want it, I think the cutting edge, such as it is, can be found by looking at this hypothetical website, allmusac.com, at which we see two different visitors being charged two different prices for the same CD. Something that might be done as that site records the number of nanoseconds that elapse between the time you view a page about a compact disc you might want and the time your trigger finger finally hits, buy it now. And there are those who don't even seem to have time to register the price before they buy, and those who linger and browse and come back and finally buy. Perhaps the former should be charged more than the latter since they don't even appear to be paying attention. Now, is this a good idea or a bad one? As somebody who tends to buy before he thinks, I think it's a bad one. But more rigorously, it causes us to ask how we should conceive of even the simplest of transactions when the technology underlying them allows for such nuanced distinctions to be made. Here, of course, both Jeff and Robert have visited the site. They are charged the same sticker price but with their frequent buyer card are given an individualized discount to get them back to the original price that they were respectively asked to pay in the first example. Is that less offensive than the first example? It's functionally equivalent, of course, but maybe it might sit better with us. These are phenomena that will find their way to the real world. So if one uses a frequent buyer's or other kind of card, it may well be that the price of a loaf of bread becomes indeterminate 
There's a sticker price that no one pays. But then when you take the bread up front, you'll find out what your special discount gives you as a result of your relationship with the store. Of course, you don't even have to vary price. You could vary service. So you could say, there are some people who arrive at a DIY store. They go to the Home Depot, and we know the ones who hog the attention of the attendants and then exit not having bought a single nail. With these kinds of cards, we can figure out who the good customers and the bad customers are and appropriately alert the staff to flee when they see the wrong kind of person. That's privacy as defense. I want to think about privacy as strategy. And this is starting to expand the notion of privacy away from just I as a consumer or a citizen have certain secrets or private facts that I'd like not to have exploited about me. And rather starts thinking about what is really the core of privacy. And I think part of the answer can be found in this. This, of course, is the iPod. How many people have iPods? How many people on the webcast have iPods? Raise your hand. Yeah, see, lots of people have iPods. In fact, the market for iPod accessories alone is extraordinary, including this pink Naga Hide case for an iPod. 32 million iPods were sold last year. That's one for every second. A $3 billion market and $1 billion for the accessories. $1 billion for accessories like this, a small electronic dog that dances as your iPod plays. <laughs> or like this, the HMS Daring, the newest and most fearsome warship in the world, coming out of UK docks at approximately $1 billion for that warship. You'll be pleased to know that they have built in iPod docks and surround sound, thereby doubling the market in iPod accessories in a single year. So what does the iPod teach us? It teaches us that we have a certain identity with that object that transcends its functional value as a player of music. If your iPod is stolen, it's somehow not the same just to get a new one. There was something about that iPod. In fact, some people inaccurately, I believe, think that their iPods get to know their tastes and in a random shuffle play start to play the stuff they like better more often. Now, that's a form of putting your identity into the artifact and taking your identity and vesting it outward from your physical self. That's actually an expansion of the private sphere. It's vesting your identity in new places and seeing new ways for it to express itself. That's why I have right now up YouTube.com, an opportunity for people to present their own videos and for others to rate them with hundreds and hundreds, thousands of videos submitted to YouTube, many of us having seen them. Somebody just playing mumbly peg with a knife, it turns out, can have about the appeal as watching an episode of one semi-favorite television show. YouTube makes tons of money, 100 million page views a month, and none of the content under its rubric belongs to YouTube. Or consider the iTunes Music Store, which includes now a section for podcasts invented by just a handful of people and now channelable so that if you type Harry Potter in, you get four featured webcasts, none of which are approved by J.K. Rowling or her agents, all of which are people in a room with a microphone talking about Harry Potter for others to download, to subscribe to, and to enjoy. Consider even virtual worlds where more and more people are spending their time. A hundred million people worldwide logged in every month to play interactive computer games. Quite an amazing undertaking, given that my suspicion is that nearly everybody in this room would deny having anything to do with a virtual world. These are people who invest their identities in those worlds such that if the world should be shut down, they don't just feel as if they were thrown out of a movie early. They feel as if a piece of their very identity has been lost. 
We could go on and on with the number of instrumentalities that have come up in which citizens find themselves investing some aspect of themselves and maybe even creating new ones so that some woman named Jenny can create a dog naming service online with a storefront every bit as impressive as a regular one. It says, her name is Jenny. She just has a knack for finding fun creative names that perfectly suit people's dogs. So you send her a picture of your dog and a little bit of money, and she'll send you back three names. And if you don't like the names, she'll send you more names. She'll keep sending you names until either you go away or, well, I think that's pretty much it. <laughs> or the site, sorry everybody, put up after the most recent American election, one American decided to say sorry to the world we tried and invited others to join him in expressing with a single photograph their apology as well, such that we got over 32,000 people sending in photographs of the sort that say, believe me, almost half of us are very goddamn sorry. This spawned a book spin-off, the Sorry Everybody book. It also spawned the responsive website apologiesaccepted.com, <laughs> where the rest of the world had a chance to say, yes, thanks anyway to the 49% including this lovely but characteristically straightforward sentiment from the UK, we understand, from France, apologies accepted, and from Singapore, at least you could vote for your prez. <laughs> and I would be remiss if I didn't mention sorryjustisntgoodenough.com, <laughs> the website that finds the whole exercise not to make him feel any better, and of course, we have nothing to be sorry for.com, complete with cavalry hat. There's some sense in which this is just, of course, the trinket of the day, an interesting momentary thing to glimpse at. But then you think, wow, what is it that could cause 31,000 people from around the world to send in photographs that actually have a political valence to them? It starts putting one to the question, as the quote goes, it's been said that a million monkeys and a million typewriters would eventually produce the works of Shakespeare. Now, thanks to the internet, we know that is not so. <laughs> but while we haven't reproduced Shakespeare randomly, we have found amidst the people who surf the net day in and day out an audience so vast, so varied, that nearly any idea, if it has some grip, might be able to get critical mass or at least some takers. And when we don't judge the value of the idea by something as raw and inapt as the number of page views, the number of successes that we can see arising from this media, successes that I say are anchored in a sense of our private sphere finding an opportunity to expand through the medium, we're quite impressed. I think, in fact, the way that these spheres expand and most importantly can interact with one another suggests that private can, in some important respects, become the new public. Let me explain what I mean by that. Consider something that Yochai Benkler pointed out uh, in his papers, in his most recent book just coming out, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration Click Workers Study. NASA had an odd job, the sort that puts Tom Sawyer's white wicket fence to, uh, picket fence to shame, which is that they had pictures of the moon and of Mars with craters on them. And these were regular standard bitmap images, and they wanted the craters to be vectorized. To put it less interestingly, they wanted people to draw circles around craters. They just asked for people on the internet at large to undertake this task, and thus did the Crater Identification and Mapping Project find, to NASA's surprise, that within a week, the work of a single graduate student for a year could be replicated. I'm not sure whether this put the graduate student out of work, at least out of misery, possibly able to put in new work of a better variety than that, but it's also meant that in real time over the network, we could take optical character recognition 
as we scan each book of the Bodleian Library, if it comes upon, say, Tim Berners-Lee, the name of the founder of the World Wide Web, in fact, it scans that sometimes without assistance as the Tim Berners League, which I imagine is a bunch of lumberjacks. <laughs> you can do a video game that surfers on the web, truly having run out of things to do, can play, where they score points when they shoot at the inaccurate translations and win points when they correct them. And thus, in real time, you can put the collective organic computer of the world to work to make optical character recognition turn out better. These are the kinds of grid applications that suggest a certain emerging public consciousness from individual private actions, like Shot Spotter, a series of microphones set up in certain neighborhoods such that if a shot is fired, the microphone picks up on that particular wave triangulates among multiple microphones to it and summons the police. Augment it with a neighborhood watch where we don't just have the police watching from closed circuit televisions, but the public at large, able to hit a button if they see something strange going on, at which point two other members of the public are sent for verification. Do you agree that there's something strange going on here, at which point the police can be sent? And you have quite a force to be reckoned with. It would be remiss not to put in, I think, what is becoming the central example of individual expression cohering into a single quasi-public whole, and that, of course, is Wikipedia, now with over one million English language articles. Now, I'm sure many of us have encountered Wikipedia online. The basic idea is, if you search for it in Google, it has such good karma, it will come up as quite a high-ranked search. What's most impressive to me is that the entries in Wikipedia that we think most controversial, most sensitive, are typically the ones that reflect the most depth, the most care, where you actually learn the most by reading them, knowing that these entries are entries formed by an idea that is clearly lunatic. The idea is that anybody can add an entry at any time, anybody can delete an entry at any time, anybody can edit an entry at any time. If somebody came up to you in 2001 and said, I'm going to build an encyclopedia to rival Britannica or surpass it, and that's how I'm going to build it, by throwing open the doors to the world at large to edit it at any time, you would have quite foresight to say anything other than you are crazy. And yet here is Wikipedia. Here's the entry on Rachel Corey. She was an American protester in uh, the occupied territories in Israel, and she stood in front of a bulldozer to stop it from knocking down a house under disputed circumstances, and the bulldozer killed her. And as you might guess, there's quite a lot of controversy around these circumstances. And this article reflects incredible debate, because with every article, there's not only the article, but a corresponding discussion page where people who make changes to the article justify them to the world at large as they go back and forth. And so we see in Rachel Corey discussion about whether, in fact, this picture of her burning an American flag in a protest before she went in front of the bulldozer is one that ought to be A, in the entry, or B, above the fold, and whether a profile picture is appropriate as the lead-in picture. The kinds of discussions you could imagine taking place in the editing room of Britannica, if they have one, among the handful of editors assigned once every interval to write entries like this, and in fact, I would be surprised if there were an entry on Rachel Corey in Britannica, foregrounded. We're able not just to see what the oracle says, but the debates that precede it. And quite typically, these debates tend towards moderation rather than towards an endless edit war where you go back and forth on a fact, with one person introducing it, another excising it, and a third introducing it again. In fact, Wikipedia is not just a technical instrumentality where people edit. It's an entire culture. It's an entire ethos where it's understood with the three reversion rule that after the third edit, that's it. You're not supposed to put it back even if you still disagree. Instead, you must take it up on the discussion page or even refer it to Wikipedia mediation. An incredible culture that has grown up in order to explain how something is inexplicable 
is the existence of Wikipedia, which until recently I was still ready to bet was a secret project by something like the Soros Foundation with paid experts actually writing the pages. It explains how that could not have to be the case. Or even think of Pledge Bank, started by the unassuming but brilliant Tom Steinberg, where he realized that we often have a collective action problem. He says, I'll set up a very simple website where you can say, on Saturday, I will appear on the banks of the River Isis and pick up garbage as long as 20 people agree to do so as well. And it keeps track of people committing to this. And once the critical mass is reached, voila. Hence was the Open Rights Group formed here in the UK with a commitment of a five pound a month standing order for a year, so long as 1,000 other people were willing to make the same commitment. And the commitment was exceeded uh, before its deadline. Now, it's true that we see these tools being yanked out of their cultural fabric and simply replicated willy-nilly, often by commercial enterprises. So we have Shop Wiki, where you can look at some particular kind of handheld radio, and there's a dialog box at the bottom that says, put in something you like about it and press Submit, and it'll make a list below the thing, and you can put in something you don't like about it. Or here at Encarta, Microsoft's answer to Wikipedia, which pre-existed, uh, predated Wikipedia, you're supposed to, if you see something wrong in an Encarta article, put in a summary of suggested changes and other comments and click Submit, and an editorial re review team will review it, and at some point in the future, maybe your contributions will be in an uncredited and uncompensated fashion made to better their commercial product. So that's a new kind of public coming out of people feeling at home with these instrumentalities. So powerful, in fact, that it's worth dwelling for a moment on this new public possibly going against government. You may be familiar with Jing Jing and Cha Cha. These are the internet police of the city of Shenzhen in China. They have their own website and blog. They say things such as, you should all strictly limit your own behavior on the web, and together we'll create a healthy internet environment and maintain harmonious internet order. See you often. A somewhat ambiguous <laughs> salutation. Or on the other side of the Atlantic, this new symbol of AT&T with the Death Star superimposed on it, your world delivered to the National Security Agency. There's certainly a sense that as we go online and go digital, the prospects for surveillance of what we do en masse, not just by corporations looking to maybe charge us a different, probably lower price for something, but by governments looking to gather intelligence as a threat. And what we've seen are distributed ways of actually people combating it, for better or worse. Tor, the onion router, asks people to offer up their computer and bandwidth as a node, such that somebody from far away can ship his or her data through it, and then through another and another, so that by the time the data gets to the other side, as a matter of digits, where it came from, or what it says, from the point of view of the intermediaries, is not easily knowable. The success of Tor as an instrumentality is directly proportional to the number of people who decide to sign up and use it an odd form of netizenship, where you don't simply look at the internet as something that comes into your house and you use like a utility, but something for which your choice about how to use it can in turn affect the fabric of the network itself. How readily one can be anonymous can in part reflect the votes counted one bandwidth and connection at a time, the people who want to make a political or other anarchic perhaps commitment to that kind of anonymity. But even the people behind Tor don't say anonymity at all costs. They have in their charter the idea of accountability, technical methods not to reveal your identity, but to punish you should you do things that people don't like, punish you in the realm of the network itself, or even to retain control, like with riding the bullet where if you publish a document, Tor may see to it that it is stored all over the network, but you as the publisher still may possess the only key by which it might be retracted once it's upon the network. In other words, these tools that take the private and make it into a new public don't inevitably mean 
that the new public is utter lack of accountability or utter chaos, but rather we see simple answers to such things as here now more recently in China, you do a search on Google for a sensitive subject, you'll see at the bottom of the page, thanks to some transparency by Google, that in accordance with local law and regulations, a portion of the search results aren't shown. Similarly, in China, we see if one tries to set up a blog in the Microsoft Spaces blog server in its Chinese language version with a title, say, I love freedom of speech, human rights, and democracy, results in a message that says, uh, you must enter a title for your space, and it can't contain prohibited language such as profanity. <laughs> now, this has led by some to some outrage expressed over the internet. I don't know if you can see the Microsoft flags flying from the <laughs> tanks outside Tiananmen in that mashed up photo. But more important, what we see first is think about Google itself and other search engines. They, like YouTube, offer no express content on their own. What they're doing is crawling the web and indexing it, other people's web. And secondly, they are judging the ranking of results in major part, plurality part, by the rankings that the public at large assigns in their act of linking from one site to another. That's how it knows whether something should appear as a 136,000th hit, which my guess is no one gets to, in fact, Google won't allow you to get that far down the list versus number one or number two. It's tapping into people's judgments. And similarly, I see ways in which we can tap into people's judgments for public spirited, public interest purposes. In the case of evading filtering, if that's what we want to do, or at least identifying it, we can set it up so that people as netizens can ask that their computers alert the central nonprofit authority if they can't get to a certain website. And if they can't, that mothership can ask other nearby machines to try as well. And with a process of triangulation like shot spotter, can say, this block is thanks to your own misconfiguration, please just fix your computer, or it's because of your parents, putting on filtering software, or it's your ISP slowing things down, perhaps for mercenary purposes, or it's your nation not wanting you to see certain sensitive political content. We can create a collective dashboard of gauges where the more of us who step forward to do it, the more accurate these gauges become. A whole new way of understanding how to collect and distribute information in real time that takes what happens down to the nanosecond, not just to change the price of a loaf of bread, but to understand and measure the network itself. And indeed, I think if there's a research project crying out for more attention in this space, it is not unlike global warming to come to have a science of understanding the phenomenon that at least keeps pace with our abilities as people to be the phenomenon that understanding where the internet is going in its future ought to be paralleled with measuring the growth of the internet, the direction of the internet. And just as we can do it with detecting filtering worldwide on a real-time map through the individual actions of people volunteering their connections, so too can we use it to judge the quality of code that they might be about to run or any number of other things. Now, I'm telling such an optimistic story. I need to refine it. I need to have some balance to it to really express the situation I think that we face right now. And that, I say, is almost public versus public. The force I'm talking about of aggregating individual people who feel newly empowered to move their private selves into external spaces and then to collectively create something new, it's such a powerful force that it obviously could be used for things that may seem undesirable. Now, the number of security incidents has been on the rise, in part because of the generative characteristics of the net, where anybody can write code anywhere and over the internet, get it onto your computer with you just clicking, sure, yes, I'd like to open this file. And before you know it, you're running something new that might as easily be spyware as something good. A great example of that is Skype. 
a program so fearsome that until recently it was banned at this university, from what I can tell because it worked so well. Also because it helped route calls for others if they couldn't directly do it elsewhere on the network, which meant that network resources here might be, in the default case, devoted to others, something that runs afoul of a network policy that says you can't use our network for others' purposes. So with security incidents and spam on the rise, spam, of course, has been on the rise for a long time, and it's still going. I'm waiting for the moment when more than 100% of email will be spam. We saw the rise of the mail abuse prevention system, MAPS. A man named Paul Vixie decided he'd had enough in the mid-90s. And what he did was he simply kept a list of those internet addresses that he believed were involved in spam. And the first thing he did with the list was, people on the list can't email me. The second thing he did was make his list available in real time to anybody that wanted to free ride off of his trouble of figuring out who's a spammer and who's not. Hotmail decided to free ride. So if Paul Vixie didn't like you, you couldn't send mail to anybody at hotmail.com. In fact, at one point, Paul thought that another such system that sent test emails to figure out who was a spammer and who wasn't was, in fact, a spammer. And he blacklisted them, and they blacklisted him, and the war continued. But what we see then are lots of individual decisions being aggregated or single decisions being aggregated back out to the individual, such that Microsoft might tell you, meet your computer's new bodyguards. This is new software that will tell you what you can run and what you can't if you want to be safe. Now, how to think about this, I think, is difficult, because it's serving a function that in other places is typically a function served by public authorities. And here, it's not. It's being served by a private firm. One possible way to think about this traditionally is in the United States, the case from the 1940s of Marsh v. Alabama, while the town of, where the town of Chickasaw, Alabama, was owned block, stock, and barrel by the Gulf Shipbuilding Corporation. This town saw a Jehovah's Witness come on and want to distribute leaflets, was thrown off because it was private property, and the United States Supreme Court decided, no, it's as good as public property, and the kinds of limits we put on the public for what protesters can be arrested and when on the streets ought to apply to that private entity as well. That's a much harder kind of rule to apply to the collective power I'm talking about, where there isn't a Paul Vixie or a Microsoft channeling it, but rather a collective peer-to-peer -peer consciousness arising, generating judgments. How do you tell that consciousness that it needs to be mindful of due process? There's no process for which you can insert that. Let me just illustrate that with a couple examples. You may be familiar with Facebook.com. In the United States, more than 80% now of university students are said to have an entry in it. Here's the entry for uh, former uh, student Derek Slater. It includes a number of photos of Derek, including photos that it turns out were taken by others and tagged as having Derek in them. This comes from her entry. It's called Paris is Better with Derek. But now when you look up Derek, you see his photos because the tagging automatically linked it up. Now, armies of people are out there right now taking photos and putting them onto Flickr. And soon there'll be cameras that automatically send your photos up to Flickr as you take them, stamping them with the time and the date and the location. There'll be a GPS, so it'll know exactly where the photo was taken and thereby make it a searchable field. And thanks to technologies like RIA, which uses face recognition technology, once one of those photos is tagged as being Derek, all of them are automatically, which means if I were to take a picture of this room in a little while and put it up on Flickr, many of your names would be automatically filled in because somewhere your name already appears tagged next to a photo of you. This has troubling implications. Consider the Christian Gallery News Service, something that was started in the mid-1990s which, among other things, took pictures of women in the United States seeking to get abortions at clinics. And it made sure to try to get them coming out of the car and the license plate, if at all possible. With RIA and other technology, this means suddenly now your identity is searchable online the moment that you step out of that car 
or that you make a protest that someone films. It actually oddly makes for a much more identifiable world rather than a less more chaotic world. Consider to Gawker Stalker, where people are encouraged to send sightings of celebrities to gawker.com, and as they are sighted, Gawker tries to get them up within 15 minutes so that if Jack Nicholson is at Starbucks drinking a cup of coffee, you can be tuned in and alerted and be able to be there before he's done in order to stand awkwardly near him before he has a chance to leave. Combine this with the kind of reputation systems that we're talking about and that we are familiar with, and I see actually a chance to enter a cafe in Paris, say, with a tricorder. And you go into this cafe and you say, first of all, is there anybody on my buddy list in this cafe or within 100 yards? Second, are there any of my 10 closest friends, 10 closest friends within 100 yards? And if so, and if they've also said they'd like to meet, we should meet. Are there people who are graduates of Oxford? Now, graduates of Oxford, as I've learned from attending congregation, is a rather large group. How can we winnow it down? Well, we have reputation systems. On eBay, you get a variety of kinds of stars, depending on how people think of you as a seller or a buyer. In SciWorld, the 18th most popular website in the world, largely thanks to people in Korea using it, where you have a virtual world and you decorate it, you put your identity there, you rent it, by the way, should you stop paying, you lose all your clothing. We see rating systems that make it so that every day you check in and through the actions of others anonymously rating you, you have a rating of your sexiness, your fame, your friendliness, your karma, and your kindness. And as you interact with people, you try to maximize the kinds of behaviors that would have them, in turn, think well of you for these purposes. This has led to somebody writing the I was a Psyholic, a Psy World Addict article for Oh My News, the newspaper in South Korea that's composed by people at large writing articles like Wikipedia and sending them into an editor who decides whether to publish them. If you ask me, it's sort of out of the frying pan and into the fire. But this is somebody who sees that her existence can be defined and measured precisely, if not accurately, by the reactions of others. That can also end up in the real world, just the way that the price discrimination can end up in the real world from uh, Amazon.com or the supermarket discount card. Because we're going to be more and more indicating our identity there with a fingerprint reader on a laptop computer, and that can be aggregated together for collective judgments to be made. Now, these judgments are not always right. Sometimes you get accidental juxtapositions, such as this billboard for childhood obesity, don't take it lightly, next to my kind of shopping spree from McDonald's. Sometimes, even when you try to make good associations, you can't, such as this page for the official LEGO Creator Activity book, where we are told that you can buy it with a perfect partner, American Jihad, the terrorists living among us today, for which you then say, well, what does Amazon know about me that I don't? And when we think about something like Google or others in China, all of the effort that Google puts in to making sure that you are targeted with just the right ad when you run a certain search. What if that technology were put to the service of subversives who liked reading this tract, also liked reading this tract. This guy just read two of them. He's probably a subversive. This is exactly the kind of collaborative filter that can have implications, especially as it can get gamed. I'm reminded of, speaking of games, the Yale-Harvard game uh, a couple years ago in which people went through the crowds on the Harvard side as the Harvard pep squad handing out sheets of paper for them to hold up at the halftime of the game to spell out a message, which when the signal was given, people enthusiastically held up their sheets and waved them around, spelling out a message that only they could not see as they held it up. I don't know if you can tell what it says there, but it was not the message that they were expecting. <laughs> How do we deal then with this new power of the masses to determine our own judgments about each other when they are not channeled through a public authority or even through something at least as suable as the Daily Mirror. 
And for that, I want to just stop by thinking of hints from three institutions. Institution number one, the Internet Engineering Task Force. Three of its founding members posed here for their 25th anniversary photo shoot, showing that you can build a network out of just about anything. Here, I think it's aubergine and squash. Um, it's not really a functioning network. It's ear to ear and mouth to mouth. And I'm hoping that's an inside joke from the founders of the internet rather than a mistake. But the group that they founded to build the internet and to maintain its principles was porous. Anybody could join the IETF. They simply asked to keep the network simple, to let anybody set up shop upon it, and to be able to add new applications to it. When they argue in rooms like this about how to make the network work better, to understand that it will simply be merit, not democracy, not voting, but whoever has the best argument should win. And how do we know? Rough consensus. We'll call for a hum in a room like this. And if the hum works out well, we'll know we have consensus. It also made two key assumptions that have been sorely tested in the past few years, that people are reasonable and that people are nice. It's those kinds of assumptions built into the very fabric of the internet such that when your Ethernet card sends a signal, it might collide with the signal of your neighbor's Ethernet card. It's understood that both cards will wait a decent and random interval before sending their signal again in order to make sure there's not a collision the next time. You can have either of those cards say, I'm not waiting. I'm just going to keep hammering home my signal, which would lead to better throughput, but bad community ethics at the Ethernet level. And I have yet to encounter a card that violates this norm. Other norms a little more hard to maintain, such as the norm of not asserting that you are Miriam Abaka and having millions of dollars to share from your ex-Nigerian husband when you send an email that can still appear as if it is coming from that very person. So then how can the principle of an organization that is a standards organization has a smiley face in how do I participate in the IETF, it leads to the question of, can it really work? And at the protocol level, there were many, many doubters. That's why their mascot, if mascot they would have, would be that of a bee. Because it said, I'm sure apocryphally, that scientists never figured out how bees fly. Their wingspan to fur ratio is too small. I'm pleased to tell you, if you take nothing else from this lecture, that in January, scientists finally figured out how bees fly. I'll spare you the details. It turns out they flap their wings very quickly. <laughs> so that's one institution that might give us a, a hint about actually having faith in people, even though people will sometimes let you down. Wikipedia is that way, too. When it finds abusers on Wikipedia, people just vandalizing, it actually sends a fairly nice note to the person saying, unconstructive edits are considered vandalism please stop and consider improving rather than damaging the hard work of others. Naivete or an actual attempt to enlist people out of their cynicism and into a new way of thinking. For Wikipedia so far, not yet having survived or having to experience the onslaught of public relations executives looking to make the entries for their respective companies look great, so far it's worked. Another set of institutions, I can the ITU, the International Telecommunications Union, the World Summit of the Information Society, I believe these are all the wrong way to think about internet governance. The best feature of these things are that they keep the busybodies in a room with themselves, not bothering the rest of us. Why is that? Because if I had to think about an internet governance research agenda, it would be a hypothesis about what makes the internet work that goes in the opposite direction from the ICANs and the ITUs and the WISSESs and the WIGIGs. It would say that the right question to ask, the right question for our nascent, really not yet existent field is this. What are the digital environments that inspire people to act humanely, that actually get people to put the best of what humanity has to offer into the space? This is not the typical lawyer's question. Probably ought to be, but it's not. I understand that. But let's be more analytic about it. This isn't just closing eyes, hiding under a blanket, and hoping that people can just get along. Instead, it's saying that the smaller the group, the better sometimes. A town hall works as a town. 
It doesn't work when it gets too big. It's hard to hold a referendum that's meaningful among too many people across too many different walks of life. It has a model of apprenticeship where people actually understand the culture, the political culture of the instrumentality they're learning to master from people who are already there. And Wikipedia strives mightily to encourage that kind of apprenticeship as new people stream into it and start creating entries. It has an availability of exit so that if you don't like what you're experiencing in one realm, you can go to another. It means carving up the internet into maybe some discrete cantons. If you don't like Wikipedia, start your own. Rather than thinking that one size fits all governance once and forever is the way to go. It also asks that people have a stake in what they're doing, that they are involved in something that matters. If you present somebody all at once, what's your view on Ethernet cards? It's not obvious what your stake is, and the amount of time it would take to tell you would mean that by the end of it, you'd be ready to vote for dog catcher more intelligently than you would wanting to figure out internet governance. And making the slices of decisions matter can help. And just one example of that, again, is Rachel Corey's entry. The community of people built up around that entry in Wikipedia is not the same as the community of people arguing about something completely different on Wikipedia. You actually have Wikipedia not as a single encyclopedia, but as a set of miniature communities organized around an idea, which is the entry itself. And sometimes you see two entries that really ought to be the same one reflecting two different communities who then negotiate on how to merge the two together. That includes, I believe, the freedom to do wrong. The thing that makes Wikipedia work over that Encarta mimicry that I showed you is that you have an opportunity, if you want, to do the wrong thing. You can vandalize the page. They'll clean it up later. Within five minutes, it'll be gone. But you have the opportunity to do it. And every time you go in there and you don't do it, you're affirming something to yourself about yourself and to the community. That's different from having everything vetted. And I believe these are the kinds of lessons that can give us some advice even closer to home. Because there's a third set of institutions that I want to close on. And that is, of course, the university. I believe the use of the internet within the university generally has so far been uninspired, maybe even a failure. When I see laptops in classrooms, when I look at them, this is what I see. When I see them go on the network, solitaire turns into networked hearts. Or even worse, I've seen it, not yet in Oxford, but I, <laughs> believe me, it's coming. This is what some people are doing in class. They're actually making money playing poker online. And it's not just the students, it's the faculty who have, I believe, not just played poker, but have you heard of EssayGrader.com? That's right. You can have your essays automatically graded by computer. Their website shows you an algorithm with arrows and boxes to show you just how good it is. Students, they say, are happy with it because it gives them instantaneous feedback. And here's a sample of the feedback. You appear to have included only six concepts from this chapter instead of the 10 required. The concepts included that are from this chapter are crime, labeling, primary deviance, time, and white collar crime. Put in the others. It turns out, of course, doing this kind of semantic analysis means that if you were to rearrange all the words in the essay so that they were alphabetical instead of in their sentences, it would get the same grade. <laughs> to essaygrader.com, Hey, that's, we'll work on that. Wait till version 3.0 comes out. To me, it says we are at risk of thinking that we're going to mechan mechanize the wrong things. We see our faculty saying that their lectures ought to be protected by copyright law. And in fact, they ought to read a little thing out. We could have our beetle say it before I start talking, who says, this is protected by copyright. It's being recorded. If any of you were caught learning from this lecture, you'll be in big trouble. I know there's little risk of that, but <laughs> it's why I think we saw Fathom.com, started by this university among others, not exactly succeed. 
It was started in a dot-com, dot-co kind of way, and it's now an archive. Its materials are available for free, but it hadn't yet figured out what I believe, which is that the future of the internet in this environment ought to be a great one. It ought to be one that calls upon people to take the same kind of efforts they put into arranging their musical playlists and give them the tools so that they can arrange them in intellectual playlists and say, these are the books and the readings in this order that I think are great to really understand this period of history. And then share it with others and let them mix it up. And in fact, have the system know that when two groups of students somewhere in the world are reading the same text, to put the effort that Google puts into knowing that you ought to see an ad for dog food into saying these two classes would benefit from being connected right now. They're reading the same thing. Let's get them talking to each other. That's the kind of functionality that the internet invites us to build. Having a stake in what we learn, I am marveling at the fact that what we ask our students to do is to write essays and turn them into one person who reads them, and that's it. When there's a whole Wikipedia out there in need of criticism, of argument, of expanding knowledge that matters to the world, what if we unleashed our students on that so that it mattered? Now, some of them may need other incentives, like those offered by Innocentive.com. This is a science site where a bounty is put on the solution of difficult chemistry problems for biotech companies. And at Innocentive, you can go and you can say, fine, I'll solve the problem, then you pay me the bounty. And it's been remarkably successful. How many chemistry students could we actually set upon Innocentive and have them know not just that they might get paid, but that they're affecting a real problem with what they do? I think it's a wonderful thing that our library here and elsewhere is scanning the works of dead people to make them available to the rest of us forever and in a searchable format so they don't have to be chained to a wall anymore. That's great. Our next challenge is how to make sure that the works we produce anew are ones that stand on the shoulders of the kinds of technologies that get us working together, talking together, collaborating together in a way that simply was not possible before the internet came around. Looking backwards, we see something like the Internet Archive, oddly enough, not started by a university, started by a guy named Brewster Kahle, who ran a very successful search engine, trying to make sure that everything that appears on the web stays forever so that tomorrow's historians can look back and see it. That's looking back. Looking forward, I see that we have a chance to build monuments to humanity that are not the pyramids of old, done under slave labor, made as simply a monument to one vain person that we look at as a curiosity now, but that it actually is a chance to invert it and to say, what can we build together as a group where, yes, there will be bad people among us, there will be inaccuracies among us, but our role as netizens is to actually join this fray, not to wait for anybody to do it for us. And our role as academics is to see how we can connect to that world at large and invite it in. That, to me, is a future of the internet that I would like not to stop. And now I see I should stop, and instead should simply then say, thank you very much.